Hi, my name is Audrey Emran Beardsley. I'm an associate professor at Arizona State University. Today I am the very fortunate host of a show titled Inside the Academy, during which we are going to interview Dr. Jerome Bruner. Thank you, Jerome, for being here today. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. You were the only son of Polish immigrants born here in New York City in 1915. Tell us about your childhood. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, <coughs> about my childhood. <coughs> My father, uh, first of all, let me be clear about uh, several things. First of all, um, I grew up right out, outside New York City, in what was then Lawrence is now Far Rockaway, I'm not something like that, and grew up on a block called Seneca Street, and Seneca Street was sort of the first chapter in my life. It was a very interesting one. We had a gang, we had a gang of kids there that, uh, had a combination of loving sports when we make up some of the sports of our own, but also, funnily, as I look back at the thing, kind of creative, making up stories and so on, like making up games, not playing the regular kinds of games. So, for example, um, anything that you could produce that was somehow a little bit off color and funny uh, was important in the gang. So, for example, <laughs> on, the, on the corner of Seneca Street and Mott Avenue, there was a mailbox by the corner of my house, there was one of the mailboxes, which had the usual stamped into it, U-S-M-A-I-L, U.S. Mail, you know, kind of thing like yes. that. So I kind of won the prize of the week by saying, that really doesn't stand for U.S. Mail. It stands for Uncle Sam Married an Irish Lady. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the truth of the thing like that. And I picked that up as kind of symbolic because uh, there was always in that group with Freddie Myrick and Bobby Hecker and Jerry Reesfield, the, the, the four us uh, to somehow <coughs> get our version of what reality was, so to speak, and to make it a little bit funny. Um, our parents didn't quite know what the hell to do with it. <laughs> uh, because we were like that. anyway, they all all went on, and that was that was in the period from about age seven to age twelve or thirteen, uh, and so we we grew we grew up then with this as our territory. That is, we had a sense of territoriality and kind of ownership of the neighborhood, mm. and so when new people moved in, like in the, in the house, in the, in, the, in the row of trees behind us, a family moved in, and um, they didn't have any kids. The name, their name was Duncan. <coughs> and the, the curiosity of me was, who, who were these Duncans you know, coming into our territory? So although we were city kids or suburb <coughs> suburban kids, there was a sense of belonging. So. It was a funny kind of thing. Uh, that, that was the early period. I had a sister, Alice, uh, and, and an older brother and sister, who were much older like that. They were important because in some ways they served in a kind of parental role. I used uh. to say, my brother Adolf, for example, was the first, I was thinking about it the other day when I went to a visit, another visit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he was the first one to take me to the Met. Mm. Um, so I had that, but also the, the, my sister Alice, who was the one who was always the question, I was called Sonny in those days, Sonny, what are you, why do you think that? Uh, and she was very, she was very smart, but um, she hated school. And um, so when the time came after she finished high school, she refused to go to college. Mm. Uh, to the un considerable annoyance of my mother, I might say. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, so there was there was that there was that early that early period, and then somehow things went into a next chapter. After my father died, we moved into New York City for a year because my my mother sold the house, went to New York. Didn't quite know what the typical kind of widow reaction. Didn't quite know what to do. Uh, she still had these two teenage kids, Alice and me. Um, so then we moved back 
to the place where we had lived before, where we had so many friends. And it was at that time that I turned into a water rat. Water rat. A water rat, indeed. Uh, we, Lenny Jacobson and Whitey Stern and Justin Bayer and I, um, got involved in boats and rowboats mm. and so on like that and went down and helped at the local yard uh, cleaning the boats for which we got free, <laughs> free rowboats on our own <laughs> and went out and explored the coast. This is on the Atlantic coast there and the Atlantic inlet that goes in so it was fairly safe for kids. And um, the water came to mean something to me and has remained that way. Uh, I've always been closely related to it because I, when we got started like that, we then, one reason or another, Lady Jacobson was the, 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 the rich one of our little gang at that particular point. And uh, we got interested in outboard motors as you know, <laughs> you have something coming up, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> So we got an outboard motor, and then through one way or another, we got a racing hull. And we decided that what we would do is typical of this group of four kids. We took the engine and we made it so that it was smooth as could be. That is to say, we put graphite in, turning over the motors to smooth the cylinders and so on like that. And we took the boat and sort of finished up his bottom and um, decided that Lenny was the, the owner, that Le and we, the, the kind of, the, the, the boat was called the Demon, yeah. and we were the Demon crew. So we got the thing in great shape, and, and the motor and the boat in great shape, and decided that Lenny should drive it in the round Manhattan race. Mm -hmm. as, as it was, in those days, there was an, around, I don't think they do it anymore because there's too much shipping in the harbor now plus the fact that probably the kids aren't as crazy as they were, sure, were then. Sure, at that time. <laughs> Something like that. So um, he entered the round Manhattan race, we got everything all something like that, and they had both an amateur and a professional division. And who do you think won the round Manhattan race? He certainly <laughs> <When> did. <laughs> oh, well, he, he won it. He won it, and uh, th then, and then we were terribly proud, of course, in Motor Voting Magazine, they, 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 there was an ad for mobile oil, Nothing like that. And they asked Lenny whether he would pose for a picture for Logan or this young this huh. kid. And we were then, just before college. Before college. Uh, just when we, we were high school kids. So um, um, we did that. Then that sort of went on for a while. And um, Did you attend public school here in New York? Uh, yes, I did. I attended I, mostly public schools, yes. Um, my last... My last year, um, when, when, when my mother my mother moved around. When my father died, we started sort of going back and forth to Florida, and um, after that, and so I, you don't realize it, but you're sitting in the presence of a graduate of Ida Fisher High School in Miami Beach, Florida. Wow! Madam, yes, if you please, and because she would go down there, and I would sort of go back and forth, and wherever she went, I would go to school. So I had to learn somehow to be a kid who was not just okay in studies, which it was, but although I kept that down a little bit, um, didn't, I had a little bit the feeling you, you don't want to show off that you're the bright kid in the class. I mean, <laughs> perish the thought of being the bright kid in the class. So, um, uh, how to put it? Yeah. So. Uh, so down, so there was down in Florida, still fooling around with boats and, and um, sort of back and forth. And how to describe it? Uh, exploring Biscayne Bay the way we had explored the area around us, so the, the, the water rat still continued. But that was a that was a particularly interesting kind of thing because we also. I also had to show that, that I was okay in school. So I, I discovered that I'm a fairly fast runner and at 400 meters and did that. And I can't remember whether I won or was runner up in the city championships or something like that. And 
So we had our, at, at Arthur Fisher High School, I'm not only a graduate, but I was captain of the track team at Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems so hard to, to reconstruct the thing. And um, so then um, there was going back and forth. And my family, because of the fact that my brother-in-law had most recently been there, my older sister's husband, uh, wanted me to go to Cornell. And I was already in that rebellious stage. And I decided that what I wanted to do was not there. I wanted, I've been reading in the paper about all of these brilliant scholars who'd been attracted to Duke University, to Duke. which was filthy rich. Um, uh, as William McDougall, Donald Adams, and all like that. So I went down to Duke and uh, found that it was made up of two, things. a great majority of the kids were sort of nice Duke kids, and something like that, who like play at games and something like that, and um, uh, with girls who were very interesting. I liked them. Like, you know, I still, <laughs> I still, yeah, remember Helen Pollard and and and, and some of the others. So uh, they were Southern. Sure. Of girls, and I had forgotten about the fact of the degree of sophistication of Southern girls, mm. much more in touch with them. So I got to touch, and then I had my own gang. Uh, of, we gathered around students in McDougall's class in his, in his seminar, and we would hang out together. And they were graduate students some instructors and so on like that. And I was a kid, so I was kind of adopted in. And um, so I, gradu I graduated from, from Duke. Uh, and while, while I was there, I had the great good luck of the great William McDougall decided that he would, when I asked him if I could be of any help to him, he said yes. So I was his assistant in, the, in his famous experiments to show that there was something to Lamarckian evolutionary theory. Mm. Uh, if you get a group of animals trained, that somehow the training would pass on to a next generation. Very, very conflicted stuff now. And um, so uh, I finished at Duke. While I was there, started a new phase of my life. I became interested in doing research. And they said to me, uh, yeah, you could do research. And I said, could I have some rats to do the research on? Mm. So they got me my first set of rats, and I did experiments on the effects of shock. You uh, did? Yeah. At, this is uh, at Duke? Yeah, this was at still. Duke, yeah. So, and um, you're still an undergrad at this point. I was an undergraduate, yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, I was an undergraduate, but it was technically. I finished my coursework in, in three years because I got bored with it. And, Took some, so uh, my fourth year, I was technically in graduate school, although I was st still <laughs> fourth year of college, and began doing research with rats, and uh, was fascinated. Came increasingly to the conclusion that there was something missing here. There's some way in which Rats are interesting, but so damn basic that it doesn't tell you very much about what I was interested in was to understand how the hell do people work, you know? Mm -hmm. So the so rats aren't people? What? Rats aren't similar enough to people. Yeah. So, so um, I, there was no way of doing that kind of thing. Anyway, the time came and I graduated and with honors, blah, 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 that sort of thing. And I had a, discuss <laughs> I had a discussion with, uh, with Professor McDougall about where to go next. And the two choices, one of them was Yale, which was a place that was doing wonderful research on learning theory, mostly with rats and monkeys. And the other was Harvard, which was doing research across the board on everything, a typical kind of Harvard spread. Notable choices. What, what's I? Notable choices for you. Yeah. Between so the um, so uh, we talked for about an hour, and Professor McDougall said in his wonderful West England upper class accent. I think, Mr. Bruno, that you, Harvard would suit you better than Yale. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I put in Harvard, thinking that they would never accept me. I mean, who am I? <laughs> oh God. 
And, but they did accept me, and I went up there. Wow. And, um, and uh, um, got very much involved in doing the same, the same kind of research up there. But then I began increasingly to start meeting people who were involved in more social, political kinds of things at Harvard. Um, involved in poli national politics and so on like that. And I wanted to get a little bit closer to that. So I became interested in a funny kind of a question, how do people categorize things in the world? Mm. Um, and, uh, here versus there, what, what, what makes them sort them out? You know, they're poor, they're rich, they're to be respected, not to be respected. So I started working on categorization. And nobody had worked on categorization really for about a century or so, but there was some good stuff in the 19th century because this was, this was a period when Europe was coming into new riches, and particularly Germany, where they were forming this rich new upper middle class. So I began working on that and published a book which was called The Study of Thinking. Mm. And um, to my great surprise, I, th I thought, oh my God, this is such an overly intellectualized book. Um, to sell to the usual 200 people who were interested in that kind of thing. It was a knockout. Mm. And um, so then, and it, it, it been translated in the various languages. So then, right around that same period, something else happened that was a very important turning point in my life, which was that the Russians launched Sputnik. Mm -hmm. And the National Academy of Sciences brought a group together to discuss what the hell happened. And they came to the conclusion that what had happened, the reason the Russians were ahead of us, is that our schools were so lousy and that we had to improve American education. So uh, we, set up, we set up this group at Woods Hole, or the, where the Woods Hole thing mm -hmm. was. And I published a book called The Process of Education, uh, talking about the need for people understanding the structure of the knowledge they have, not just a bunch of facts, but how to take the structure and manipulate it and so on like that. And to my astonishment, that book, The Process of Education book, that came out first in English, ended up being translated into 14 different languages and has sold a half million copies, most of which has made the Harvard University Press more right, <laughs> right. wealthier than, rather than me. <laughs> Being an author, I want to advise you in case you continue writing books, yes. it will never get you rich. I know, I, I know that. <laughs> it, it will help get publishers rich. Oh, in any case, to come back to the serious business. And so at that particular point, um, I came increasingly to the conclusion that something had to be done about education. And I started pushing and organizing a group, and we set up a group of top-notch people around the country to come together, what should be done with the American educational system. And we had some effect for the first four or five years. There were changes in curriculum, so that the curriculum, rather than being a bunch of babble, really had some structure that you could you know, go from what you had learned into what was possible which to me is very central. So before this point, you were not necessarily interested in education until the launch of Sputnik, and then you were drawn into this. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's I was interested, but in a rather vague okay. way. Yeah. Um, uh, um, the education, the only contact I really had with education back in those days was the fact that Frank Keppel, who was the dean of the School of Education, a very nice guy, and I, used to play squash once a week. Oh, sure. <laughs> and when, 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 when we were catching our breath between, I don't know, you've never played squash, have you? No, no uh, I have not. It's, it's, a very, it's a very breathtaking game. And uh, so we would sit, you know, sort of take a rest after every other game, and uh, talk about education. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and then I began reading things about the way in which First, it was a study out in Lansing, Michigan, 
the way in which kids who did not have, who had, were given the opportunity of having early childhood education, education. Pre preschool education, did so much better in school than the kids who didn't. And I got kind of interested because it was related to my research. Up to, much of my research up to that particular point, I leave out things. Uh, during that research, I did a lot of work on perception. And people say, oh, it's interesting. My analyst, for example, said to me, why, he, he was a, he, Edward Bieber, a Viennese, he said, why were you so interested in perception, Jerry? And I, I don't know. I mean, I think it may have had to do with the fact that I was born blind. Yes, yeah. yeah. I and that, that uh, I don't remember ever, ever, ever having any troubles when my, my, my cataracts were removed and so on like that. But uh, I was very much interested in that. But then I came increasingly to the view that perception was based on a, a hypothesis, that is to say, your perception was selective in terms of what you expected to see. And I wanted, therefore, to study the expectations got into this. And then it was part of that same process whereby I came to the view that if the poor kid who had no expectations of anything good like that would ignore many of the things in the environment, the other things that, that in some sense it was a shutting off. And it was for that reason that I got very much interested in the idea of giving kids a head start. And it was then that I came on that Lansing, Michigan study. And I still, I still remember the, the follow-up to that. I was going back and forth to Washington because I was on, the, uh, on a White House committee on, on, on the ed sort of ed education in general. After this was after the Woods Hole report. I went to pick up Sergeant Shriver, who was uh, John Kennedy's brother-in-law, and Kennedy had died about a year or so before, and told him about this Lansing study and uh, how giving kids a head start, like small h, small s, uh, gave them a chance later on in life. And he said, I'm going over to a reception at the White House. Come along with me, Jerry. And so I went over there standing in line. And we came, well, the, uh, Mrs. Uh, the Johnson, who was then president, we came to Mrs. Johnson, and Sarge introduced me to, to Lady Bird Johnson and said to her, he's got all sorts of ideas about the way in which you can make, you give kids some sort of a head start and like that. And she said, and I still remember her accent, wow, that's such an interesting idea. Oh, we must do something about that. I'd like to hear more about that. So anyway, we then set up this committee, which then got Congress to give a measly, lousy little grant of about $20 million or something of the sort to set up head starts around the country. Kind of $20 million isn't enough to stick in your eye for that kind of a thing like that. Sure. But the interesting thing is that it caught on to go back to that period and took off. So it... It moved along. Um, then, how to describe the next thing? I then became increasingly interested in what in the hell is the nature of the culture that produces this kind of thing? What, what is this relationship between culture and mind? Uh, and I had lots of, lots of anthropologist friends at that particular point, like Clyde Clacone was one of them, Leonard Bloom, another changed his name to Broom eventually, uh, and did a summer's work with the Cherokee down in, on the, the North Carolina reservation, and it's, uh, watching their things like that, and noticed the interesting kind of way in which um, there was not, not that all much elaboration with a, you didn't hear the, what do you mean, Sonny? Mm -hmm. um, so, I got, I got interested in how we could push that. That was another thing that moved me in that general direction. And got interested in this in connection with how other cultures operated and managed somehow. Oh, and I got Patty Greenfield to come along with me too on this one. Uh, managed, I, I thought I would go to Senegal. Senegal was a particularly interesting one. And it, posed no particular problem for me because their European language was French, which I speak fairly fluently. 
And so I went to Senegal, and boy, was that an eye opener. Mm. So I decided that I would work more on the cultural side of things and got interested increasingly in the kind of cultural psychological approach. Um, and did that and came back then a few years later, came to New York to come be a professor at the New School. And the New School, the new school was interesting because they had some bright people there who were great fun to talk with and so on like that. But they were not engaged. And I had the feeling somehow that it was looking at the world from outside, that it lacked the normative thing, uh, you know, hey, what are you doing now? So what are you doing about it? So I came to NYU uh, first giving some lectures at the psychology department here, but got to know some of the people over at the law school, particularly a gentleman by the name of Anthony Amsterdam, Tony Amsterdam, who works on the excessiveness of Americans, punitive system in our legal system, particularly a death penalty, but also had done a lot of work on human rights and that kind of thing in the South. And so we decided that we would teach a seminar together. Mm. And there's nothing like getting involved in the study that's necessary before you teach something. I read, I must say, there I was by then, in my 70s or something, that I started reading again like I did as a 70. <laughs> Sure. You know, sure. Ah, what's this? <laughs> my God, how did I ever overlook this? This is impossible, you know. Uh, and started off on that, which started a new phase. So then. A new phase at 70. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so uh, so uh, uh, they said, why don't you come over? Tony said, why don't you come over to the law school? And I said, well, I don't like that. So. Uh, we went over to see the, the dean, I've forgotten his name now, and about whether I could have some sort of an appointment there. And he said, we, we've got a better system than that. We have something called university professorships, hmm. where you can teach in any uh, person or university professor. There are about, a, I think there are about, oh, maybe a dozen, maybe not that many, but close to a dozen people who are university professors. So I became an official member of the university professorship group at New York University teaching at the law school where I've been doing it ever since, working on death penalty cases and that type of thing, um, and trying to understand what is it that is so punitive about the American attitude toward crime. And I have to say I can't give you a quick summary and answer to that question because I don't know. That's what you're uh, trying to a, discover. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a puzzling kind of a question, but I'm working on it like mad. Then, one summer, I was in Europe, and I was in, I, I, we, I, I should tell you that I have a little house in, in, in West Cork in Ireland. Mm. Uh, you have to come someday, you'll watch sure. it. Sure. You know. uh, and uh, I was in touch, I, 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 had been, I had been to a meeting in New Orleans on the International Child Study Group or something, and had met a lady there uh, who was involved in something called Reggio Children. And she had, she, I had given a course, I had given a, a talk in New Orleans about the importance of the, the, the very Russian idea of not only exposing kids to ideas, but getting them involved, involvement, using the ideas for something that you don't have it just to stick in your bean. It, 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 there's a way you can think with it. So um, she got back to Reggio and told the people there about it. And the, the guy who was sort of the, the, the inspiration for that was still alive, a guy by the name of Loris Malaguzzi. And he said, you must come for a visit to see what we're doing in Reggio Emilia mm. with these kids where we take the whole bunch and we put them into a nursery school. And the main idea is to give them the idea of reciprocity projects on their own and yet learning how to cooperate with other kids and doing it in this particular setting. So there I was in Ireland, a phone call, and I said, why don't you come for a visit to Reggio Emilia? That was 16 years ago. 
Mm. So I went and was knocked off my pins. Boy, not only was the school doing something, but the people in the town, if I can use the Italian expression, fierta, you know that proud, proud. Sure. They were so proud of their Reggio children. This, in a town, as I was mentioning to you before we started on all this, which was famous for its high-tech engineering and for the making of women's dresses, which it ships by the gross ton to the, to the U.S. The for, for, sure. for, for you gals to look somewhat Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, I got involved in that, and the importance of two things. One of them was the reciprocity, that is to say, entering an adult world where the adult answers your questions as best he can and finds out what it is that you're trying to say and continues along that. And then the group gets together and shares their stuff of that kind. And the level of exchange was remarkable. So I went back, then I should mention that, that year that before I got there, Malaguzzi died, had a heart attack. So in another way, my going there was partly because there were mostly women as get involved in, in early education like that. I think they needed a man to somebody who could, you know, <laughs> go talk to the mayor, you know, sure. kind of thing like that. I hate that kind of thing, but I'll do it if it's necessary. It, it, yeah. it gets um, the job done. Yeah, and uh, a lot of this goes back to my sister Alice, as you could guess from what I was telling sure. you about. It was a very strong, <laughs> strong minded one, and uh, I come. I come from a family of strong-minded women. Um, <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, like the, uh, among the graduate women, I had like like Sue Carey, <laughs> and Patty Greenfield, uh, examples of that same time. So, what was I saying? The, the, um, oh, I, I went I went there, uh, and it was so. It was so interesting the extent to which it had the effect of opening in my mind as well, as I've got a lot of education, the importance of certain kinds of basic skills like the notion of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. That when I talk, I should not only be talking, but I should be trying to figure out whether you're understanding what I mean. Mm -hmm. And teaching kids that, three-year-old kids that, where it's a very interesting idea. They don't get super efficient at it, obviously, but it gets them on the way to doing it. So I've worked on that, still going back. Um, and it's interesting to me, gradually, the idea has spread. And now Reggio Children, despite the fact that you haven't heard about it, has become, <laughs> has become world famous. Mm. And the great problem is what in God's name you do with the number of visitors from North America and Sweden and so on like that who come to see it. And that, so they've set up a little institute for foreign sure, visitors, sure. <laughs> which is a good way to solve problems, as you know. <laughs> yes. Sure. Um, and so doing it that way. So that that's uh, that that gets me up there. And what's what's so interesting again? I'll repeat some of the things. What's so interesting is that it has given me a kind of a you know, contrast very frequently increases your consciousness. So I live for a month in the summer in a very European setting, European Italian setting, particularly. Oh, in spite of the fact that my, my Italian is simply awful, <laughs> they won't let me learn it. They all want to learn English. Oh, so, sure. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, no, per favore, in, in, in English, eh, per favore, you know. Other, um, so I, I go on speaking sort of dumb schoolboy Italian. <laughs> I wouldn't do it like that. So what I really what I really needed what I really needed was the usual sort of business of getting into a foreign language, which usually takes all kinds of odd forms. Like I'm very fluent in French, but I had a French girlfriend, <laughs> which goes a long Jerry. way. Well, <laughs> you know, um, a French girlfriend who certainly disabused me about all the stereotypes about French women, let me tell you. <laughs> Have you ever known any French women well? No, but I've known a lot of the women that I've heard about through your stories. <laughs> yes, yeah. 